I'm Dr. Richard King, a board-certified obstetrician-gynecologist of 40 years. I regularly perform surgeries two days a week during my professional career. In addition, I had the opportunity to conduct clinical research in gynecology and other fields of medicine. I met Larry and Belinda Wern about 20 years ago. They told me they were having success treating block fallopian tubes in their physical therapy practice, using just their hands to clear adhesions and open the fallopian tubes. Naturally, I was quite skeptical. But after reviewing several of the charts from their physical therapy clinic, I realized they were getting results that would be difficult to achieve in surgery, and I'm considered a very good surgeon. I have followed the worms and their treatment of adhesions with absolutely no remuneration for the last 20 years for two reasons. One, I'm fascinated with what they do and the results they achieve in several conditions normally treated with surgery or for which there is no effective medical treatment. Two, I believe this work is important to medicine as a conservative therapy that could eliminate many surgeries. Belinda and Larry have each treated roughly 40,000 patient hours over their career. They have published studies in scientific reports and in some of the most respected journals in the United States, including Fertility and Sterility, Gastroenterology, the Journal of Endometriosis, and WebMD's Medscape General Medicine, edited by George Lundberg, the former editor of the Journal of the American Medical Association. I hope you'll find this guided trip through three decades of their investigation of the manual treatment of adhesions to be as fascinating as I do. I give you a man I'm proud to call my friend and colleague, Larry Wern. Hello and thank you for that kind introduction. I am Larry Wern. My wife and I, physical therapist, have been treating adhesions and involved with adhesions for 30 years of our professional career. Initially, we began treating adhesions and investigating them for very personal reasons through a nightmare we were undergoing, then through hundreds and finally thousands of patients. We started gathering data, gathering physicians, biostatisticians, scientists, to design and publish studies on whether or not we could actually treat adhesions non-surgically, manually, using just our hands. The data is pretty compelling, we think. I'll let you make your own decisions. The upside of this is that if adhesions can be broken apart non-surgically, and we're not talking about just you can massage that and that'll go away. No, that's kind of far-fetched, but what is the actual structure of adhesions and what can we do and what data do we actually have that has been published in peer-reviewed journals that show that adhesions can be broken down and decreased, perhaps eliminated non-surgically. The upside potential is huge for patients, for physicians, and for insurers, certainly for patients because they don't risk undergoing another surgery. Surgery is the normal treatment for adhesions. When they get bad enough, a surgeon has to go in there and cut or burn adhesions. The problem is that no matter how brilliant and skilled the surgeon, the body creates new adhesions to heal from the, from the surgery. So with each surgery, you develop more and more adhesions, at least many of these patients do, and there's good data on this. Other risks include the cost, certainly for insurers, this is a big deal. The surgeon, the surgical attendants, the anesthesiologists, the renting of the surgical suite, those of you who have read the latest data on the effects of anesthesia and multiple anesthesias on the brain, know the risks there, and the information coming out is pretty compelling that there is a significant risk with a lot, to a lot of patients with anesthesia, general anesthesia. The risk of inadvertent enterotomy, when a surgeon goes in there and he or she is looking around trying to cut through adhesions and some of these patients are so adhered, it's really difficult to see what's going on. You can inadvertently cut the, the bowel, the intestines, 
a little bit leaks out and suddenly you've got contents of the bowel in a warm, moist, dark environment, then you close that patient up and three days later they're in excruciating pain, they're developing peritonitis, you have to open them back up in many cases, pour antibiotics in and allow that patient to heal from the inside out, creating a huge scarring situation, of course adhesions being internal scars. Um, so, and certainly that is the a case with bowel resection where you're actually intentionally cutting the bowel to remove adhered or diseased or necrotic tissue and reclosing the bowel. But we'll look at that data. We're not talking about simple massage here. The idea that you could actually just go in and massage these is, is a little far-fetched, so we're going to look more deeply at the structure of adhesions, how they're composed, and um, how this can work, so you can make your own determinations at the end of this. We will go through the 30 years pretty quickly now, um, looking at the where we started, the structure of adhesions, and what data we have found, and where we're going next. 1984, my dear wife, summa cum laude physical therapist from the University of Florida, developed massive adhesions after 72 hours of internal radiation therapy and 40 external radiation treatments. They put her in a lead-lined room with radioactive pellets inserted inside of her, said, you know, it's dangerous for any of us to be in this room for more than about five minutes. But don't worry, we'll keep you drugged. You, we really need to get rid of this tumor. A year after that experience, she began having debilitating pain. Whenever she walked, moved, or breathed, she was in excruciating pain. I saw my beautiful wife and brilliant wife just, just deteriorating before my eyes. We talked to her doctors about it, and they said, well, her cancer, you know, but we, we you really don't want us to operate there. I mean, this vaginal tissue and pelvic tissue is so delicate, we're just going to create more adhesions. So she'll just have to learn to live with it. We were not interested in following that prognosis. Um, we know that she had a frozen pelvis where everything was stuck together. All of her organs in her pelvis were just adhered together, stuck like in a straight, massive straitjacket. We could not accept the diagnosis that you're just going to have to learn to live with the pain. We began to investigate on our own ways that we could perhaps decrease adhesions without surgery. We learned that adhesions form naturally in the body whenever and wherever the body heals. They rush in to surround the area that's been injured. Once they formed, if they don't dissipate within seven to 10 days, they're with you for life. The problem is that adhesions are made of collagen and collagen covers virtually every structural cell in the body. So the body has no way to dissolve or detach adhesions on their own. Once they've formed, they stay there. They either stay the same or they get worse over the course of life. This is probably what my wife's body looked like year after her radiation therapy, where everything was stuck together, the adhesions forming ropey structures that glue or squeeze structures that should be able to move freely. It causes dysfunction, can cause infertility, can stop literally organ function, and can cause a tremendous amount of pain. Gram for gram, we know that adhesions are actually stronger than steel. They've been estimated roughly 2,000 pounds a square inch, so you can lift a horse with a square inch of them. When they attach to structures, they can cause significant pain, and the surgical answer up till now has always been, well, let's cut those out, let's burn them, and certainly you can cut or burn the ones that you can see. You can't cut or burn the ones that are inside of an organ without cutting into that organ causing more damage, even when you just cut or burn the external adhesions, the data shows that after surgery, and this was a study from several hundred thousand patients, a 50-year study, 
showed that 55 to 100 percent of pelvic surgeries and 90 percent of abdominal surgeries cause adhesions to form. It's from digestive surgery, and you have the, the reference there. You can pull it off our website if you like. Looking a little deeper, here's some adhesions as they form. They're like tiny strands of collagen here shown, depicted in a muscle forming from cell to cell within a muscle. You can imagine that it's really virtually impossible for a surgeon to get to those without injuring the, the muscle. Looking even closer, we discovered that these tiny strands themselves attach to each other and to the underlying structure with a molecular chemical bond. That bond, we found, is susceptible to dissolving or detaching by using sustained pressure and some other techniques that we use. Certainly we have to be very site specific, understand the anatomy very well, understand where we are in the body and be able to understand what's adhered. But given that, we find that we can be very successful with many of these patients. It takes a bit of time, but as those bonds dissolve, that strand detaches. And sure, it's probably still attached to the other side, but there's already collagen covering every cell in the body. The important thing is that it detaches from the next one, and the next one, and the next one. So it becomes like pulling out the run in a sweater, in a three-dimensional sweater in very slow motion for us. Looking at other depictions, we started, after, after we treated my wife, we started treating other patients who came to us with pain, and we were initially surprised when women with black fallopian tubes started reporting they were becoming pregnant, and their tubes were opening. It was very easy to check that because there's an HSG, a dye test, where dye is inserted into the uterus. We radiographically view that. See, it has not come out of this particular tube. There's a hydrous helpings there, a swelling in that tube as well. After therapy, dye has come through one of the tubes. There is still a hydrous helpings in that particular tube, but this is just one of them when we'll talk about hydrous helpings, if you like. We wrote to the gynecologist in town and we said, you know, we're seeing results in opening block fallopian tubes. The chief of staff of the hospital, Richard King, who you just met, called us in, a research gynecologist and surgeon of 30-odd years experience at that time. He said, what's, what's this about opening black fallopian tubes? Just handed him a half a dozen charts. And he looked at them and he said, gosh, you're, you're doing things with your hands. I'm not sure I could do surgically. And I said, well, is that okay? And he said, well, yeah, it's, actually, it's really great. It's, it's neat. Have you done any research? No. Would you like to? Sure. Well, let's research this. I'll, I'll join you if you like. You, you need to have somebody that understands research, and I'll just chip in my time. I'm, I'm pretty fascinated. So we began doing research on our patients, presented at the American Society of Reproductive Medicine, a meeting of about 9,000 uh, physicians, did a couple of posters and an oral presentation on decreasing adhesions for hydrous helpings in this particular poster, improving some other functions in women with endometriosis and followed up with a study we published which is now available at the U.S. National Library of Medicine, PubMed, and Alternative Therapies in Health and Medicine on open block fallopian tubes. And at the time we, did, we just had a very small in, I think there were 28 patients in this study and our success rate for opening block tubes was 61 percent. Still pretty good we thought after um, just manual therapy, just, just using our hands, pulling these adhesions apart. But it was a small number. As a matter of fact, in 2015, we published a 10-year study, a retrospective of nearly 1,400 women. Interestingly, and in, in this case, we had 235 women with totally blocked fallopian tubes either both tubes blocked or one removed and the other blocked, so we had half the chance to open tubes. We had a 61% success rate, uh, the same success rate. The, the, here you can see the comparison of the therapy in blue versus surgery in green. 
interesting subnote in that is that the patients who had not undergone tubal surgery prior to, to our therapy had a 69% success rate for opening tubes. Those who had undergone a prior surgery had a 35% success rate. So again, it's, it's the adhesions that form after surgery that, that are problematic for physicians and patients. Functionally, our success rates were quite a bit higher than the studies we could find for the surgery, where our pregnancy rate was 57%, about double of what the surgical success rates were for pregnancies after surgery. As an insert, we've seen success with other hormone-based conditions. We were surprised when FSH levels plummeted in many patients, and we saw that 39% became pregnant, even though their FSH was 10 or above, indicating subfertile or infertile conditions. When we treated women prior to their IVF transfer, 56% became pregnant with their next IVF, much higher than the national success rate. Interestingly, some of our highest successes were in women over 40. The success rates were close to three to five times pregnancy rates of IVF without a pre-transfer therapy. Some women started calling us and saying, gosh, I'm having some unusual side effects. Anybody ever reported that to you? And we said, what, what are you talking about? He said, well, well, it's a little embarrassing, but I'm having orgasms like I've never had before. And my wife said to them, is that okay? Well, well, yeah, it's great actually, but it's just so remarkable that I wanted to report it to you. We, we started getting more and more reports like this and we started talking and we mentioned it to Dr. King. He said, that's really important. We is, we, it is, we said, yes, it is. He said, there's nothing really in medicine that increases orgasm and we can measure those, those responses what do you think we're doing and we said well we're doing nothing but what we always do we're treating adhesions so if sometimes there are adhesions in the cervix and it feels fibrous just a nose to stiff and we'll be working on that so the husband's running into that then they're having pain with deep penetration um, otherwise on the vaginal walls we're working on the vaginal walls maybe those adhesions there forming from bacterial infections vaginal infections or, or rushed sex or just adhesions there are masking the nerve endings, decreasing desire, arousal, lubrication, and orgasm. And I know those particular domains because we could actually measure those domains of sexual function in our patients. We did publish a study in Medscape General Medicine, the largest uh, medical journal in the world, owned by WebMD. This is the one that George Lundberg edited after editing the JAMA for 17 years. Um, that showed the increases in sexual function, decreases of intercourse pain were very high and decrease in improvements in the other domains of sexual function are shown here. Desire, arousal, orgasm, lubrication, and so forth. Women started coming to us saying, gosh, you know, I, I've been doubled over for two days of every month with endometriosis pain since you since you treated me my, my period came I never even knew it was coming it's totally surprised me that's that it was shocking to them and and we really didn't know that much about endometriosis at the time of course we were just treating adhesions what could we be doing to, with these women well we found that adhesions form wherever endometrial tissue lands in the body, it's frequent and often that we find adhesions forming. We believe that what happens is, again, we're not really treating the endometriosis, we're just treating the adhesions. That as those tissues swell every month with a woman's period, it's pulling on those adhesions, creating a pull on the underlying structures, creating pain in the underlying structures. And as we break those adhesions or detach them, the decrease of pain is significant. Again, the only other thing that these women could do is 
either go on birth control pills if they didn't want to have a child so the tissue wouldn't swell, or have surgery. So this presented a nice alternative for people that did not want to have their endometrial implants burned off and didn't want to undergo surgery. We published in the Journal of Endometriosis, the founder of the Endometriosis Association joined our, our board of advisors, she was very impressed, and uh, started measuring. That study showed the improvements in endometriosis pain just from therapy alone lasted for over 12 months, which is as long as surgery has ever been shown to, to last. Um, as far as function, again, in our recently published study, or our 2015 study, we, our success rates for pregnancy for women who are infertile due to endometriosis were about equal to surgery. So that's from 299 women. As things progressed, and meanwhile, my wife by this time, she's working full time, she's, she's doing great, she has no pain, she's, um, we're gung-ho and really pretty fascinated. We, we started realizing that there was another problem for a, a lot of our patients, and that is people started calling us and saying, oh, I'm having bowel obstructions, I'm going back and back to the hospital for another and another surgery. I'm in the hospital for, with an NG tube in my nose and an IVs in my arms. They're cutting me open, um, and the worst part is I, I don't know when I'm gonna have to go back adhesions form in the bowel as they did with Belinda. We saw in some of those early slides, just as they form anywhere in the body. They can form on the outer loops of the bowel, squeezing it like a garden hose. They can form inside the bowel as they do in fallopian tubes. Bowel adhesions can be massive. And this is an image of some bowel adhesions that you can see, so you can see that it's it can be a huge problem when structures like this form in delicate tissues that are supposed to be helping your food move through 21 feet of your small intestines down to your large intestine. What do physicians do when the bowels become obstructed? Well, cost of bowel of adhesiolysis surgery that is the surgery to decrease adhesions itself is significant. This is from 2010 from the Department of Health and Human Services. And the patients that just went in for adhesion surgery averaged a little over eight days in the hospital and about one out of eight of them were readmitted to the hospital within 30 days, probably from some of these, often from some of these complications I mentioned earlier. In the bowel, it can be really serious as strictures of narrowing or total obstructions prevent food from going through the bowel, life-threatening condition. The average cost to insurers and to the U.S. population is over $100,000 a piece, um, for, and there were over 100,000 of them performed in 2010. The, cost and quality of life is much huger. So here you have an ordinary American citizen who suddenly they can't take food in. They feel nauseous. There's a tremendous pain. They, uh, nothing's coming out, there are no sounds. They go to the hospital. In the hospital we do put an IV in them with some Demerol or Dilaudid, something to help numb things and give them, help slow, slow down, it will actually can stop motility altogether, but then when we're gonna give them liquid to, and nutrition, IV nutrition, put an NG tube through their nose into their stomach to pump out the contents of their stomach so that we don't build up pressure there, and now we're just gonna wait, and we're gonna see, sir or madam, if this clears. Well, what happens if it doesn't clear? Well, if it doesn't clear, we're gonna, we generally will cut you, we'll, all, we'll always cut you open. We'll pull out usually all 21 feet, examine that bowel, wherever it's bad, we'll cut what's bad, throw it away, sew back what's, what's still okay, put it back into you. And um, that's, so that's what we're looking at while, while you're lying here. Okay, 
we can do a CAT scan to see if we can find out exactly where it is. Hopefully we can do this laparoscopically, but it is a major surgery. So the average wait in the hospital is over two weeks. About one out of five is readmitted to the hospital within 30 days of their surgery from some of the complications I talked about earlier. 35% are readmitted. They have another surgery within within 10 years during their life. Two thirds of those within the first year. This is from Lancet, a highly respected journal, as you all know, from 30,000 patients, and you see the data there just as I have extrapolated it. Huge problem in medicine. Brilliant surgeons wanting to help their patients, but at the end, after the surgery, they can look at their patient and say, here's my card, the chances are reasonable that you're gonna be back, that this is going to happen again. For our patients, they tell us, you know, it used to be that every day I'd look in the mirror and say, what do I want to do today? What do I have to do? Now I look at the mirror every morning and I say, is this the day I'm going to die? Is this the day I'm going to be put into the hospital and maybe cut open? I'm afraid to go on a trip with my spouse. I'm, I'm afraid to go to my sister's house. I don't know what I can eat. I'm afraid something's going to clog it up because I know I've been compromised and I know that those adhesions are going to come back. My doctor told me, well, they're pretty likely to come back, and they do. Big, big problem in medicine, expensive problem, and one, a problem of huge human suffering. Surgery is the primary cause of bowel obstruction. So as brilliant and as wonderful and as dedicated as your surgeon is, he or she cannot prevent adhesions from forming. And the films that they've used, the tissues and different things to prevent adhesions, none of them have skewed these numbers significantly at all. What are we looking at? Remember, we're still looking at tiny little strands. Yeah, the surgeon may see ropes or curtains of it or balls of adhesions, but at its very core, these adhesions are made of tiny strands attached to each other with a small molecular bond. What a concept to be able to go in there and like the run in the three-dimensional sweater, pull those apart so as those little attachments that are susceptible to a sustained stretch begin to dissolve. It's like pulling out the run in a sweater and without surgery, without the risk of enterotomy, without anesthesia, how, and for a fraction of the cost, what a neat concept. Once we realized we could open and clear blocked fallopian tubes, we started to look at adhesions in the bowel, really this life-threatening condition we've been talking about. One of our early patients, actually our first patient for bowel obstructions had undergone six bowel obstruction surgeries. She called us up. She said, yes, my, my last surgery was 12 weeks ago and they're scheduling my seventh surgery now, a Whipple. And for those of you who are surgeons out there, you just know how serious and uh, dramatic that surgery is. I've lost 18 pounds. I can only ingest liquids. It's getting worse and worse. You've got to help me. They're trying to help, but they're killing me. She came in and we treated her. We had by this time developed a five day program where patients start on Monday and they're done on Friday afternoon, four hours of therapy a day. By Wednesday afternoon, Wednesday evening, Belinda and I took her out to dinner. We had fish, uh, some soft cooked vegetables. She was able to cancel her surgery. She has started eating again. She can eat now pretty much whatever she likes and it's been nearly eight years now, and she's not had another surgery on her bowel since then. We began doing more serious research with before and after radiologic testing. In one case, we have a radiologic report showing obstruction before therapy, totally cleared of obstruction after therapy. Strictures, which are tightening, of course, of the bowel, 
in this case, the intestines, before therapy, after therapy, no stricture at all. So we began to get excited about the science we were developing. We hired a woman with two post doctorates and PhD, an expert in disease modeling, familiar with working at very small levels inside the body and at the chemical and molecular level to help us determine what we were doing and to help us published studies. Those radiologic reports are available in the Journal of Clinical Medicine, published in Healthcare. We created a validated study to look at quality of life differences because for us, as a physical therapy group, quality of life is very important. It's not just, do you have pain or do you not have pain? Can you eat or you're gonna die? Yeah, those are very important, but, but what's your quality of life like? Can you actually, do you, when you look in the mirror, do you feel like I got a life or my life is basically over? I'll never have my life back again. Using that validated scale, it was published uh, in healthcare, we created and published some, the first of our pilot cases presented to 15,000 gastroenterologists at Digestive Disease Week in Washington, D.C. in 2015, published that uh, pilot study in gastroenterology as an investigation of treating bowel obstructions non-surgically. As part of that poster presentation, we found that we improved and had a really tight p-value of 0 0.025. We had significant improvements in pain, quality of life, and range of motion, because when you think about it, as you get adhered, it pulls you forward. For so many of these people, they've had their ileocecal valve cut out. You're getting pulled forward into the right. Now you can't stand up, you can't bend, you certainly can't bend backwards nearly as well. So we started measuring range of motion as a measure of how well we were doing, as well as pain. We did not do as well on diet and medication because we were a little bit skewered by the numbers. Only about half of the patients that we treated had restricted diets or were on medications. So although they showed significant improvements, when we threw them in with the ones that had no problems beforehand and no problems afterwards, it threw the p-values off a bit. Looking a little bit deeper at the poster that we presented there, the dark blue at the bottom presents normal, so you can see the changes from in diet, pain, gastrointestinal systems, it, symptoms, quality of life, and medication from before on the left and after therapy on the right. For those of you who prefer numerical graphs, you can see a consistent return to normal in those areas. The range of motion changes with p-values were pretty much off the chart as far as improvements in all ranges of motion. When I asked our PhD, what do you think the mechanism is? What exactly, what all are we doing here? These are the areas that she suggested we were, where we were showing improvements. We did, as scientists and all clinicians should do, who are conducting clinical research, measure the side effects and adverse events. We did find that the adverse events, the major ones are shown at the bottom, but they were transient or temporary that tended to go away within a few days. We do screen our patients for contraindications to therapy we, because we're treating in an interstitial area. We want to make sure that people do not have infections. Sometimes we'll ask for uh, blood for CDCs with CBCs with differentials so that we can see if there's a skewing of the neutrophils. Certainly we don't treat anyone who's had surgery in an area that we're gonna treat um, within the last 30, uh, 90 days. We began creating a home maintenance program because we saw that in the beginning when we, treat, we treated one woman, she was having 
um, the typical ones. She was having bowel obstructions like clockwork every three weeks, and after we treated her, we thought she figured she was good to go. We just like put opened her tubes before we cleared her bowel obstruction, and instead of having them every three weeks, she went 19 months, but then she had another obstruction. And we had two or three of these that showed us two things. One, we were making really dramatic improvements. Two, it wasn't everything that their guts, their intestines had been compromised really for life by their surgery, these people that have undergone bowel obstructions. So we've begun an educational program with each of our patients where we teach them about the structure of adhesions, how they form, how they deform, how they can deform them themselves, how they can maintain and perhaps even increase on the, um, on the results that we, that we get. So the need for repeat surgeries is a huge concern for patients. Having been handed this card, you'll probably be back or you may be back. We do know that within a short period of time, 30% of patients will return to the hospital for a repeat surgery. This is from the literature. Before we created our maintenance program, we had a 7% return to the hospital. Since we've created an institute, this home maintenance program with all of our small bowel obstruction patients, our return to the hospital is 3%. Not zero, but better than 30. We're now conducting a larger phase two uh, study on small bowel obstruction with 350 patients. We've also recently started working with physicians who treat SIBO, which is small intestinal bacterial overgrowth when the, the bacteria that normally reside in the large intestines gravitate up into the small intestines. It can be inconvenient to totally debilitating. Those bacteria can actually start eating away at the nutrition. So we've had patients that came to us that have lost a tremendous amount of weight, they weigh 80, 85 pounds, um, or that have had the, this bacteria actually eating on the, the feeding on the inside of their intestines. When physicians treat them with antibiotics, the antibiotics can really help those decrease those uh, bacteria the problem is if there are adhesions in the gut, those bacteria will come back. They don't escape, they can't get out. So we've started working with a lot of SIBO physicians to coordinate care with their patients so the patients get, get antibiotic treatment, whether it's natural antibiotics or pharmaceutical, um, and we treat and they may go back and get a little bit more antibiotic treatment. We are the mechanics in the process we help clear the adhesion so the intestinal bacteria that get blocked up in the intestines can escape. So that's pretty much it. Um, that's where we are after 30 years of this investigation. The question in the beginning was really, can adhesions be treated non-surgically? I'll let you make your own determination. Keep in mind that in all of these conditions, all we've been doing is treating adhesions. That's what we know how to do. So whether it's black fallopian tubes, infertility, sexual dysfunction, chronic pain, adhesive pain, bowel obstruction, or now small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, the common factor for us and the one that we have used in all of our published data is treating adhesions with our hands. So to that question, to us, apparently the answer is yes.